Welcome again to Hiripek Talks. My name is Sylvie Namwase from the School of Law at Makere University. I'm also a postdoctorate researcher at the school's Human Rights and Peace Center. Today's episode is entitled Gender and Militarization in Uganda. Do women have agency in militarized Uganda? We invite you to join us as we seek to understand how militarization and militarism impact gender dynamics in Uganda. To explore this topic with me today is the distinguished Dr. Zahara Nampel. Dr. Zahara is a lecturer of gender and the law at the School of Law here at Makere University. She's also the deputy principal of the School of Law and a former director of the Human Rights and Peace Center, where this podcast is hosted. Dr. Zahara, you're most welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Namwase. It's a pleasure for me to be here. And to our dear listeners, before we proceed, I'd like to remind you that if you're interested in research and discussions on human rights, law and peace in Uganda and East Africa, then Uripe Talks is for you. The show is hosted by Makari University in Uganda and features experts and opinion leaders. Remember to like, subscribe and turn on your notifications to stay in the loop with the latest research and discussions. Back to the discussion. Dr. Zahara, talking about gender and militarization. In your view, is there a connection between gender, militarism, and militarization? And if you think there is, can you elaborate on this connection? Thank you very much, um, Dr. Namwase. Interesting topic indeed. I know that on previous talks, um, we have focused on the uh, issue of militarization. But let me start by once again elaborating on this concept of militarization. What do we mean by it? Militarization is a process that legitimizes military action and gives a heightened sense of importance of the military in the fabric of the nation at different levels, at political, at economic, at social level. So what we are looking at with militarization and militarism eventually, are characteristics that include an expanded uh, military in the civilian fabric and a preference actually for co- coercive, militarized solutions to, to problems, whether they are economic problems, whether they are social problems, the military is seen as the key actor. So when we're talking about militarization, we are seeing the key role the core role of the military that perhaps subsumes the roles of the other public actors and institutions. Gender, on the other hand, is how society is socialized. It brings about the relationship between men and women. And when we talk about gender, we are also looking at gender roles. The traditional roles that are assigned to men, those that are assigned to women, and which end up being termed as feminine for women, soft, caring, nurturing, and those that are hard and tough for men. Generally, Uganda is a patriarchal society, meaning that uh, we have a male dominance. There is a dominance of of the males. And no wonder, therefore, um, the military has also been perceived as a male-dominated. Just imagine the language in the military. Military officers are referred to as officers and men. That's already presuming or assuming that uh, military personnel must be men. Um, In a way, therefore, not only through language, but through actions, through the training, we end up finding that uh, militarization because of the, the patriarchy and eventually militarism become a product of patriarchy. Because that is the society within which uh, it emanates. And uh, therefore, because of, of the way that patriarchy dominates, militarization also reinforces patriarchal values. So you find that, for example, when uh, recruitments are happening, they are looking out for certain physical attributes such as height, such as uh, physical strength. And then eventually during the training, they are testing for aspects such as courage. They are looking for masculinity. So, for example, women who are softer, 
who are maybe who have a um, physical attributes that are not as as you know enhanced as those of the males uh or for example pregnancy of women uh if you went for a recruitment and you're pregnant you'd likely not be recruited uh because uh, the military is perceived as that institution where people must be strong and courageous and because of our reproductive function as women that is perceived to be you know a weak attribute you know not strong enough to be in the military so you find that uh, what eventually comes out is that the military is perceived to be a male place dominated by males dominated by male attributes and the institution of the military is perceived to be a protector the strong protect and those who are left out because as we can see from the statistics I'll talk about that uh, perhaps later is that uh, you have the protectors the officers in the army and the protected who are the females who are not uh, part of this uh, you know establishment of the military so of course there there is a relationship between gender and uh, militarization where you find that uh, mostly those actors the key actors in the military are the males and the others that are not visible or not considered to be playing uh, as a, you know a predominant role are the females so yes there is a link between gender and militarization very interesting from the theoretical perspective but as always we also want to bring these issues down to the ordinary people to understand how they actually playing out within the Ugandan context so how has this connection manifested in your opinion in the Ugandan context hmm. so i think first we shall look at um, the statistics as i mentioned earlier who is the key actor is it the males in the military or is it the females and we said earlier that it has, it has it is actually the males but before we get into the military as an institution let me just give you an overview of the male female representation or participation in the labor force in uganda there is generally a higher labor force participation in the military by men but uh if you look also uh at other sectors for example local government there are only 46% females in the local government in parliament uh right now the 11th parliament of uganda we only have 33% female representation and yet this is a key institution for policy making and guidance for the country uh at cabinet we are at 43% female representation and yet we are being perceived to be doing very well now going to the military the number is so dire there is only 4% of females in Uganda's military 4% 4% out of 46000 um strong army now what happens is that this affects the representation of women even at higher ranks so if you're looking at 4% or 46000 how many women are you going to find at the higher rank of the military to be able to determine and decide on key policy matters so when you see that number 4% women in the military this affects representation at all the ranks um issues such as women's welfare in the military are not going to be you know considered paramount because there is such a small figure to raise the voices to raise concern when you see the growing role of the military in civilian functions that also reflects in the budget because uh, the bigger the numbers the bigger the force uh, the bigger the budget allocated so growing militarism growing militarization expenditure it crowds out um, civilian expenditure uh, on issues such as um, you know health and education and we've seen that um, the abuja declaration of 2015 required african states to contribute at least 15% of the of their budget to health issues in uganda i think the highest that we've gone to has been 9 and we have been consistent at 
but the budget of the military has been growing day by day. So you end up finding that issues that mostly affect women, especially those in the private sector, such as education, such as healthcare, are not given, uh, you know, importance as the, the military, which is uh, taking a lion's share. Another example uh, of how, you know, the, the militarization is trickling down to a practical level. Just recently, during the COVID pandemic, 2020-2021, where uh, Uganda perceived, uh, at least the, the president of the country, perceived the pandemic as a war, you know, even the language of a social economic um, challenge, a disease, was perceived as a war, meaning that even then the military was put at the center of fighting this war, rather than perceiving it as a social economic issue where people of low economic standing would be assisted, where women's reproductive health would be focused on, and other uh, social economic issues. In that instance, it was difficult for many women. It was reported that many women could not access uh, reproductive services. Women were not considered to be part of the essential workers. Okay, The essential workers included the men and the women, the few women, in, in uniform, and also some of the other former workers. As you very well know, uh, the largest percentage of, of women work in the informal sector. So you find that... Uh, Women were largely at home, women were largely in the markets, and they were not perceived as being, you know, key in the struggle against a, a social economic issue such as COVID. A lot of funding came in for the COVID, but it eventually found its way to the coffers of the military because those were perceived as the key actors um, in this struggle. So you find that uh, we have an expanded role of the military. Um, issues that affect women, children are not given, um, you know, paramount importance because of the perception that um, the military is a, a key actor. Indeed, that's very interesting. Actually, that you also brought out COVID, and earlier on you had mentioned about this relationship between the protector and the protected, because we know in feminist uh, analysis. The protector who, you know, assumes that role then has, uh, or wields a lot of power, um, uh, in relation to the protected. So they then get to make uh, the decision that in their own opinion, they believe are best for the, uh, for the good of the protected. Mm -hmm. So we got to see decisions that were made during COVID-19 mm -hmm. in the interest of the protected, but actually were detrimental to the, uh, to, to the protected. So like you mentioned about, the women who couldn't access re reproductive health care because of unreasonable uh, curfews and un unreasonable regulations about uh, getting uh, permission in order to, to move. So it, it's indeed very interesting to see uh, how actually militarization then seeps into modes of governance and decision making that have detrimental uh, impact on women because it actually also directly impacts democracy. Mm -hmm. Because as we know, uh, militarization or militarism values uh, top-down uh, methods of decision-making, mm -hmm. hierarchical methods mm -hmm. of, of decision-making, as opposed to participatory. So I would imagine it's a vertical uh, form of you know, decision-making, mm -hmm. unilateral even, as opposed to participatory bottom-up. And we have, uh, uh, you and I, been on this uh, research project for, it's coming to four years now. Mm -hmm. And we've been in the field in different parts of the country. We've been to the north, to the east, to the central region, to the western region. And we've seen some of the sectors where actually the military has been deployed True. purportedly to enhance the performance of those sectors. Mm -hmm. We know the origin of most of these, uh, of, of these processes was uni unilateral declarations by the head of state. Yes. But our general findings actually point to that model of top-down approaches with exclusionary impacts. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit about what you found in the fishery sector? I know that uh, for, uh, for agriculture, when I specifically looked at Operation Wealth Creation, we did find an increasingly higher level of participation by men, it seems, in the Operation Wealth Creation project. Uh, me, women seemed to remain in the periphery, and even then, the few women that we saw that were deliberately picked out as good case studies 
or for the for the program there were still some lingering issues around um, the actual continuous level of support that they should be accorded as women in the agriculture sector to make sure that these inputs though you know though meant to increase their their agricultural yields uh but are rather expensive and the women actually con- needed continuous support to to realize uh, wealth through this this program which was not really forthcoming so there were a lot of gaps uh, even from the gender perspective as mm-hmm. far as uh, operation wealth creation was concerned partly because of the top down uh, approach that it takes but you looked at fisheries can you also tell us a bit what you saw in terms of the gender dynamics in that sector okay um thank you first of all it was interesting that um all the photos all the documentary evidence that we came across in terms of testimonies never once said that there was a female officer on the lake all the patrols that we met on the road were i don't want to call it manned but you know uh they they were men that were patrolling the lakes so already there is that perspective that men play the key role in the military and uh, we saw a very minimal role of women in this institution and i think it's also related to that overall you know not only representation and participation but also the training that is received in the military where you know there is tough aggressive training which focuses on you know the physical attributes a lot of physical punishment for failing to achieve uh, tasks in the in the in the training that chain of command that you talked about which does not allow for negotiation so when we the you know the testimonies that we came across on the lakes is about you know chain of command commander has instructed for the following so even for example women were not allowed to smoke fish and that is uh, that was always the, the work of the women in the fishing communities and uh, the fishing act does not prohibit smoking of fish but the military came in and uh, followed the directive that there would be no smoking of fish and anybody found doing that would have committed an offence and they came down very hard on them including uh, you know physical abuse we come across an interesting uh, phenomenon in western uganda where the military was uh, forcing women found with the uh, smoked fish or supposedly immature fish forcing them to put it on their breasts you know um, purportedly to breastfeed it which was found to be a very inhuman act in western uganda and culturally insensitive very culturally insensitive so you you find that this is an institution that is male dominated but is very very insensitive to uh, feminine attributes um that that example of forcing women punishing women by fo- forcing them you know to breastfeed which is a largely female attribute is a failure of this institution to understand the gender dynamics and that also i mean um i think it also has a lot to to do with the the failure of the the military to transform into a gender sensitive, sensitive institution if you look at the way that uh, the narrative of the the UPDF has come along from 1987 and even before during the the bush days the five year bush days uh, there is so much focus on the original 27 you know the 41 persons who were involved in the original attack on Kabamba barracks and the 27 guns there was not mention of one single women all these were men so even even when women indeed and i'm sure they did play a role they were never considered to have played a central role in the war and even today we see it so we, we see that women do not play a significant role um so all the the heroes you know are uh, supposedly they are they are male we see women playing more of a contributory role in the army and uh, that failure to appreciate the role that women can play also trickles down to how women get treated by the the lower cadres in the military so you see that even abuses 
such as forcing women to breastfeed a fish, is so insensitive because you know there, there's this male-dominated institution that has failed to understand the role of women. And I think it's also about how we understand uh, the military. Because the direct role that is played by men, you know, fighting, com- combat, being on the front line, is perceived to be the, the real, you know, fight. And yet, uh, you know, women do play other roles. Uh, there are women such as um, Oliver Zizinga, um, uh, there are women such as Gertrude Njuba, who are, uh, you know, recorded to have done a lot of work recruiting, training on ideology. But what is recorded is that these women were in charge of President Museveni's welfare, okay, and that they never participated in the battle. So these kind of narratives shape how women participate or how they are also perceived within the military. So yes, we, we found that uh, you know women were being abused through this uh, episode of the fish, but actually it comes down from how women are appreciated within the whole institution. It's, it trickles down, it's, for, it's top down. Uh, today, only three out of ten UPDF uh, officers in parliament are female. And those three positions are on, on the female uh, you know, basis, it's the female quota. So none of the other seven are female, meaning that all they can do is to represent, you know, to just fill the three seats, and that is it. So women have played a role, and indeed, uh, it's undoubted that women played a role um, in, in, the, in the war and they actually continue to play a role. But because of their low numbers, because of their subsidiary positions, you know, their roles are not acknowledged. Many do administrative work, supportive work, work that we as a country have failed to do a gender analysis to actually acknowledge the role of this work, the, the work of uh, the role of intelligence, for example. So they are, the women become add-ons. They are not the key actors in the military, but rather they are mere add-ons. I mean, look at the, the incident in Somalia where the UPDF suffered a big loss, the attack. Um, how many women did you see there? So it's like women are never deployed to what is considered as the real work in the military. Of course, there have been cases of physical abuse. There have been cases of sexual abuse in the military. And I think that is where it trickles down also to when the military is outside, you know, the, the, their barracks and are interfacing with the community, that they also continue this continuum of abuse onto the community and forcing, for example, women to breastfeed fish. So th- there is a problem with the way the narrative, there is a problem that we have failed as an institution, we have failed as a country to acknowledge the role of men and women in different ways and to attach value to different work that is done. Um, so, for example, therefore, the, the military is seen as, you know, they, they direct, um, you know, they, to be in charge of, of having um, liberated the country, but that the fighters did uh, the work. So issues such as the social, political background work that women could have been involved in is never acknowledged. Um, or even recognized, which is a problem. Of course, it is a problem because then it, uh, as you've rightly observed, um, it then uh, spreads out into the actual day-to-day social, economic, and political systems that uh, that we are dealing with in Uganda currently. And uh, you've already made that connection to the historical contribution that uh, women made uh, while um, the current leadership was fighting to uh, to gain power. But then subsequently, it seems that the conduct with relation to uh, the conduct of soldiers with relation to women's rights uh, seems to actually be uh, regressive, despite the mantra of the Uganda People's Defense Forces as a a people's army, as an army that respects uh, the the rights of women. And in fact, I think this phenomena of um, patriarchs, these African leaders, that fight um, on very grand platforms such as Pan-Africanism, uh, liberation, democracy, anti-colonial, anti-racist platforms um, have been recognized um, by Professor uh, Sylvia Tamale herself in her book Decolonization and Afrofeminism that was published in 2020, a very transform- uh, transformative book. I recommend everyone to read it. 
she recognizes these uh, leaders such as Kwame Nkrumah, Sekuture, Julius Nyerere for being very prominent fighters on these big platforms, but then also critiques them uh, for their inability to examine their standpoints on the questions of gender and how, in fact, subsequently, after they attain power on those platforms, they have been known, some of them, to really get women's issues, to ghettoize them, what is called ghettoizing them, uh, to deplatform women in their in when they are appointing their cabinets for instance and uh, in and, and in fact as you rightly also uh, noted that women are in these instances always perceived to be midwives rather than architects mm. of these movements these pan africanisms these anti colonialisms these democracies and liberation um, movements so it is really um, a, a very big issue that we we need to sit back as scholars as africans as Afro-feminists, if we do identify ourselves as such, um, and um, take it on um, in, in our scholarship of leadership. What does it mean for women um, in these movements? Should we just follow blindly and then afterwards cede, cede power to men to take us back to where we are in, we were in the first place? So that's a very good point uh, of analysis to continue. And I'd actually w- I'd like to also point out one prominent woman actor during the Bush War, the NRA Bush War, uh, who is on record for having gotten into a misunderstanding with the current leadership, or specifically the current president of the country, mm-hmm. precisely on issues of participation. And that is Dr. Winnie Vianyema, mm-hmm. who's the current executive director of UNAIDS, as you know. It is on record that actually she was um, in, involved in a, a disagreement with the president at mm-hmm. the time in the Bush over the issue of whether she should directly participate in the actual combat. Mm. Apparently, the president's opinion was that the bush was too dangerous for her, that she should then go and do you know, other work outside uh, of networking, of mobilizing outside. But she wanted to be on the far front. She wanted to be on the ground, and that was a point of, of disagreement. Of course, she subsequently went on, as you may know, to fall out mm. with, the, with the political leadership, with the political party, Again, partly because of issues around participation and leadership, her vision of what you know leadership would look like mm. in terms of what she thought that the government was fighting for at the time. So indeed, very interesting conversations that have political consequences in uh, militarized contexts. So then, having spoken about women, militarism, and militarization, what do we think about masculinities? How has militarism and militarization affected masculinities Mm. in Uganda? Well, first of all, as uh, as I mentioned earlier, the military itself is perceived to be a masculine space. And what is masculinity? Masculinity is that uh, space for men who are supposed to be strong, brave, courageous, what is that and what, what is courage? Courage is, uh, you know, that the understanding, therefore, is persons who are, you know, daring to die for their country, can carry a gun, can be in combat. Um, so we, we, definitions of courage, such as, uh, you know, carrying a child on your back for miles, walking to find water or firewood, or just carrying a sick child on your back, get them to a health center is not you know appreciated as 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 courage so you know even the way that um, the training happens tough aggressive training roll, rolling around in the mud and doing all these uh, physical things in order to supposedly instill discipline it breeds some kind of you know what what they term as strength for courage, so the their psychological effects of this military training, um, which change the personality, the emotional identity, and and the social function of an individual. Someone is supposed to come from that training and not have feelings, not be able to cry, to 
to show expressions, you know, to be weak. Um, so we find that institution one that encourages a form of masculinity, you know, that, that is anti-female or women. And, and it, it actually then reinforces uh, the patriarchal values of dominance and, and separation between female and, and male attributes. Because if you're supposed to be that person who doesn't, you don't, who doesn't care, who is not soft, who can't carry a child, who can't comfort because you're supposed to be tough all the time. So that, that reinforces the, those, the supposedly masculine values that we see as, uh, so if you find, for example, a man who is soft, they are called ninnies, you know, they, they are almost termed as, as women. They are too weak. How, how does a man cry? A man who has been in the army should not cry because uh, the training, uh, the, the, even the work itself of, of combat is supposed to breed mental toughness. Okay. Um, which, um, which is perceived to be masculine rather than, than feminine. Unfortunately, this then trickles down to how men and women relate in society. So t- it comes from the, the battlefield back into the homes, back into communities, back into the parliament, back into how budgets are allocated. To say that combat is important and, and defense of a nation is important and the military should be put at the front line of all activities, you know, even at the expense of, um, of socioeconomic issues. Um, let me give you the example of cattle wrestling in Karamoja. So cattle wrestling is, for me, is a socioeconomic issue. Yes, it is part of the culture of the Karamajong and its neighboring communities, the Pokot and the Tokana. Um, you know, they wrestle for cattle amongst themselves. How does the government go about it in the first place? The government of Uganda, it on arms the, 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 the Karamajong. You know, that's already, um, some kind of instilling militarization as a solution to this socioeconomic issue. Because for the Karmajong, the cow is at the heart of their existence. It is a social issue, a cultural issue, an economic issue. It is survival. But the government perceives it as a, a, military, a militarized uh, issue that requires a militarized solution. Um, so it arms them. Then, of course, it goes into the process of uh, demilitarization, you know, the disarmament process. Of, of removing the, the arms. But we forget that, uh, you know, cattle wrestling is, is a, is a socioeconomic aspect that should be dealt with and, and people's lives should be put at the center to say, okay, if, if, um, if, if, if this is what is important in the Karma Jong, how do we make their hearts better? How do we make it safe for them rather than looking at it as a, as a, as a military issue? Um, so you find that, um, you know, even the efforts by the government of Uganda to control, um, cattle wrestlers is seen as a war of sorts that the government must win by getting bigger budgets, by deploying more soldiers rather than a social economic issue, uh, for which non-aggressive means, um, of, of conflict resolution should be sought. So you find that uh, we therefore, because of this, uh, you know, perspective that the military is, is uh, dominant, is, uh, is is important, is significant, we keep uh, breeding that narrative that they have to be part of the solution in the everyday lives of of people, um, which unfortunately is a problem. Mm-hmm. For sure, and and also speaking of masculinities, um, I think that. Um, Masculinities are hierarchically ordered. They can be hierarchically ordered according to what a society perceives to be the ideal man. Mm. So while I also think militarization or militarism has done to masculinities in Uganda is to almost shape an ideal man as a soldier. Mm -hmm. So an ideal man in patriarchal societies is the leader. Therefore, an ideal male leader is a male leader who is a soldier. Mm-hmm. So that then trickles into 
our political psychology mm. and how we perceive leadership mm. and who can be a leader. Mm. I've seen in the run up to the last elections, for instance, soldiers who have said for them they cannot salute a non soldier. Mm-hmm. This is in reference to one of the main political opposition candidates, mm-hmm. uh, Robert Chagulani, mm-hmm. who is not a soldier, he is a civilian. Mm-hmm. But there is that hegemonic understanding, I think, Mm. that has increasingly taken shape in the collective, maybe not collective, but to a considerable extent in the psychology of the citizens Mm. as to what leadership, political leadership, the ultimate Mm. office of power uh, should look like. Mm. The first category, civilian. Yes, exactly. Mm. So, so, so then that is partly some of the issues that we have to unpack as we go along for scholars who try to investigate mm. how to reverse militarization or how to break away from the strangehold of militarism or militarization. Mm. These currently, these coups that are happening all over in, in, you know, in West Africa, you have to wonder if we can ever truly get out of that. And, and I think it is partly also the psychology. That historically, if you've only been exposed in, uh, you know, uh, regime after regime to military leadership, what does that do to, you know, your confidence in, a, you know, a purely civilian leadership mm-hmm. or a civilian leadership that is in effective control mm-hmm. uh, and oversight of the military? Mm-hmm. So that's, 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 um, one thing. The other thing is you touched on it a little on men who are called ninis or sissies. Mm-hmm. Because I think, again, uh, restrictive masculinities that are reinforced by militarism or militarization mm-hmm. will emphasize uh, hegemonic masculinities, mm-hmm. you know. So um, you have to be really a man, a real man. Mm-hmm. So that, of course, then seeps into, like you said, gender relations, but more importantly, also sexualities. Mm-hmm. And, you know, of course, the debate that has been going on currently in Uganda around, you know, the Anti-Homosexuality mm-hmm. Act. Yeah. And I think that is not so far removed from general discussions around militarism, militarization, and mm. just that militarist psychology on what it means to be a man, mm. that restrictive hegemonic masculinity mm. that has no room for, um, you know, any deviant, what, what would be termed in that sense, you know, deviations yes. from that ideal masculinity. Yes. So the othering of men mm. who are not considered real men. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Zahara. And um, moving on and towards our conclusion, having reflected upon these two, three really phenomena, militarism, militarization, and uh, gender relations, and we've touched a bit also on issues of democracy. Mm. Do you think the concept or the phenomena of gender equality and militarization can coexist these two concepts can they coexist um so i i think that is you've sort of answered that mm. um gender equality and uh, militarization are hard mm. to coexist it's a really difficult thing because uh when we are talking about um a, a militarized approach we're talking about a dominant the protector a first class citizen and then the other um we've already seen that we have a military that is dominated by men uh we've already seen that there is a narrative about uh, you know masculinities and who makes the best soldier the hardened you know uh battle hardened person and then when we bring in the concept of uh, gender equality gender equality is about uh, acknowledging different attributes of everybody the attributes that uh, you know persons will have which are not necessarily you know physical attributes but are emotional intelligence um softness and caring attributes where you find that that women score higher because the two genders are you know um score differently um so for example in emotional intelligence women score quite high 
but you find that uh, these are attributes that are not acknowledged that much for for the, the female. So when you talk about gender equality and yet you're fronting militarization, militarization is about being courageous and strong and you know almost rigid following a chain of command don't ask questions do as you're told women on the other hand you know are negotiators they are bargainers they are moderators which is something that is not encouraged within the the chain of command the militarized system so it is difficult for the two to coexist uh with these supposedly militarized approaches the the aggressive you know tendencies and then um this unfortunately also trickles down to the relations uh behind closed doors where uh, the the militarized man or the man who's supposed to be strong and you know the the, the upright man is that man who can discipline who can take no for an answer who can't negotiate in his home who does not allow for bargaining and then you find uh, because of this you have increased cases of uh, violence in, uh, in in marriages in in uh, relationships where men feel that they can they have the right to control um you know women's bodies um cases of rape cases of uh, where women cannot uh, uh, negotiate safe sex for example so these things trickle down in different ways because of this uh, narrative this militarized uh, narrative so it is difficult it's a very difficult thing you know a balance to gain to have gender equality on the one hand and a, a militarized approach on the other which focuses on uh, you know orders and uh, commands and fails to look at the you know all the, everything in between so i think that is not uh, an easy thing to get um yeah yes and and i and i liked that earlier on you we had actually also talked about uh, covid-19 mm. and you had talked about uh, the the level of women's representation um in cabinet in parliament and i think actually there's been studies to show that when the nrm government started out it was doing quite well i have an article here by rosalind e boyd a uh, 1989 article mm. so this was just a couple of years after they had taken power it's entitled the empowerment of women in contemporary uganda real or symbolic she's asking that question and actually in that article she's quite optimistic because she's seeing the way the government is starting out the leadership of the nrm is starting out is signaling a high level of progressiveness for women's empowerment and leadership and talking about covid mm-hmm. and that comparison we have just mm-hmm. made between gender equality and militarization we have some criticisms that have been made about the way women were treated during covid and yet at the same time the paradox that we had women leadership women leaders during the covid-19 crisis we had a female we have a female minister of health who was in charge mm-hmm. um uh you know still in charge of the ministry of health during the covid-19 crisis we had a number of other women uh in within the the the, the task force that was set up to regulate and control the covid-19 crisis and yet we continued to see all of these crises happening mm-hmm. in reproductive health right so that concept that has been critiqued very much within feminist uh circles and women's rights circles that is called power washing mm. where you have women actually taking in positions of power yes. of leadership in your mm. cabinet you have women ministers mm-hmm. you have ministers of state uh you know who are women but this is not translating into real meaningful change mm. uh for women on the ground so mm. the male militarized leadership remains the hegemon even when women are in positions of power Yeah, they don't uh, have the agency do you remember those those yes. pictures the photos sorry to interrupt you okay. about the security personnel beating women exactly selling fruit on yes. the street yes. you know the mothers yes, yes. so We're rounded up and and these women in leadership could not come out mm. and say something actually took a, another male leader yes to apologize yes. for these acts yes. you know so that yes. sort of renders the the women in leadership 
yes. as as symbols, you yes. know. Mm. So you are very right, and it's and, and it's interesting that actually it was a man who came out, as you've pointed out, mm. to 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 critique this, which which also goes to show us uh, that when we speak about gender equality, it's not just about women's rights; mm. that it's actually uh, cross cutting. Mm. Men can be advocates, mm. and actually the purveyors of patriarchy can actually also be women themselves. So. In that sense, gender becomes a very interesting, um, you know, framework of analysis. But the issue remains that uh, these two put side by side gender equality and hegemonic, you know, uh, you know, masculinity via militarization or militarism become uh, almost paradoxical. Such that if you're to really realize or actualize gender equality, you need to almost dismantle uh, militarization yes. Yes. or militarism. Yes. Yes. Okay. So finally. Dr. Zahara, do you have any policy recommendations on how we can move gender relations forward, Mm -hmm. even within the current challenging context of militarization Mm -hmm. in Uganda? Mm -hmm. How can we move forward, even with the challenge on our hands? But that's a difficult question, because you're asking us to reset society. Yes. You're asking us to reset society because, uh, I mean, Uganda is a patriarchal society. Yes. The, the male is, is in the decision-making seat. Yes, but I believe so, in the all things are possible. Yes, that is true. So how do we also, you know, engender mm-hmm. this institution that has taken the forefront in so many civilian functions? Um, I think it's not easy, but I guess uh, one or two things. First, we can. I think we need to... Um, Approach it from two levels. The micro, which is the, at the institutional level of the military itself, but then also at the macro level. And I'll attempt to suggest one or two things that perhaps can be done. I think one of the things that need to be done as a matter of policy and practice is to get the numbers up. Bring women or at least I don't, I don't call it bring women because they are, they have a right to be at that table mm-hmm. of decision making, but to increase the numbers of women in the military at all different levels, mm-hmm. at all the different ranks. Mm-hmm. So the numbers should be upped so that we, we break this narrative that the military is a, is a male mm-hmm. institution mm-hmm. so that we acknowledge the different roles that women and men can play mm-hmm. within the military. So I think that is one mm-hmm. thing. How, how do we start that? Does the UPDF have a gender policy? Mm-hmm. Is it there? Or, and if it is there, is it being implemented? Mm-hmm. Okay, so that uh, we are deliberate about uh, representation, participation. We are deliberate about leadership. We are deliberate about issues that affect both men and women mm-hmm. in the institution. So we need to reflect internally on the institution itself. So that, uh, you know, we enhance the voices of both men and women Mm -hmm. in order to reflect the gender issues Mm -hmm. within the institution. And to also to increase participatory approaches Mm -hmm. as opposed to dominating. Exactly. And and inclusion. Um, But also very importantly, because we are seeing a growing role, you know, as per our study and our findings of the military in civilian functions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, So... Have we regarded gender? Have we taken gender considerations before deploying? Mm-hmm. Okay? So every time you're deploying the UPDF um, to build a wall or to do construction work or on the lake, have we done a gender assessment? Gender assessment together with the other assessments, human rights assessment, mm-hmm. sustainability assessment, but democracy. the gender, yes, democracy, but the, and, and, you know, the legal assessments also, mm. but have gender considerations been made when we are deploying? Mm. If we are deploying in a village, in a, a small fishing village in, uh, Namisi Indwa, mm. on, you know, in, 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 in Eastern Uganda, how, how many men and women are patrolling the lake? Mm. So that we have consideration that if, for example, a directive goes out that they are going to break all the houses here within three days, okay? Have we had a consideration that there are women in here, that there are babies in here, that there are watering spots in here? So we need to put gender considerations at the forefront every time 
we are deploying the UPDF mm-hmm. in civilian functions. Mm-hmm. It's not not enough to say okay we are following the law and etc mm-hmm. because the UPDF has a right to support mm-hmm. you know in productive activities yes they are supporting mm-hmm. if it is in agriculture what mm-hmm. are the gender implications mm-hmm. because you're deploying men mm-hmm. in agriculture and it's mostly the women who are involved there what are yes. going to be the considerations there so that's something that we need to do but related to this um away from just the the institution of the army we need to um evaluate as a matter of policy the military involvement in civilian functions and limit and i think this is a uh, for me is very important a very important recommendation we need to limit the involvement of the army only in as far as is necessary yes um you know for 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 whatever objective is is being sought um so we need to say that does the army need to come in here in this particular sector and that of course will eventually mean that we need to evaluate and say uh we need to evaluate the budget to say that okay if we are uh, deploying the army in um wildlife uh what gender considerations are being made there what are the budgetary implications who is losing you know which sector of the is losing in the budget and we, what is the military gaining so where are we taking money from so i think it's important for us to to be making those um analyses and and considerations um and we need to to be mindful and deliberate not to take away budgets and resources and human resourcing from key sectors as we keep you know boosting and enhancing the the military as it is doing this work otherwise we stand to you know to keep diminishing um sectors such as health such as education where women are the first to feel the brunt of this So for example when you're deploying on the lake um you're not only taking away the livelihood because men sell this fish but you're also taking away the the source of food when you take away the source of food the person who is charged with feeding the home from the first instance is the woman she's then who's going to suffer yes the man will too so we need to make that examination but we need to be to be able to make it also at a macro level to say what is losing because the military is gaining so we need to have that overall holistic approach every time we are deploying but i think the key message is we need to be careful um in deploying or in enhancing the role of the army at the extent of other public institutions i think for us as the human rights and peace center we're talking about um article 16 uh we're talking about sdg 16 about uh you know institutions accountable strong institutions yes where we're not only having one institution that is uh, subsuming everything else every other role and dominating but we have everything coexisting mm. and in that way we'll be talking about uh you know human rights democracy and gender equality okay Thank you very much indeed Dr. Zahara for those very powerful remarks very powerful recommendations and when you put it that way I'm actually confident that uh we can do a societal reset even though it seems uh, almost uh impossible So uh we have now come to the end of our episode on gender and militarization in Uganda do women have agency in militarized Uganda question mark Special thanks to Dr. Zahara Nampo again Deputy Principal of the School of Law for being our honored guest today. For our dear listeners, we hope the conversation has improved your understanding of the relationship between militarization, militarism and gender and how this plays out within the Ugandan context. We invite you to share this episode with your friends and networks and be sure to join us again on the next episodes as we continue to explore the very interesting topic of militarization. in Uganda and beyond from us at Huri Pek Talks goodbye Mokere, Mokere, we build for the future the great Mokere, great great and mighty the walls around thee great great and mighty the gates beside thee great great and mighty the walls around thee great great and mighty the gates beside
Sign.